Well, welcome back everybody. This is Dr. Corey King from AskDrKing.com. We are located in Lafayette, Colorado, right between Boulder and Denver. And today we're going to be talking about a patient. This is a patient that has been very, very tough to help. And one reason is because there's so much going on. And two, um, it's just been a, a really tough case. And the last few weekly rounds, those are all great success stories. Um, but every now and then we get a very difficult patient. And this is a patient I fall in love with their family. They're great people. I more than anything, I just want this patient to get his life back. Now today though, we did change a couple things and the wife and I talked on the phone later this afternoon and we had some positive results, which was fantastic. It's very encouraging. They're actually heading up to Utah this month to do some therapy that there's only one place in the United States that offers this therapy. So we're hoping that that's gonna kinda help push him over that edge to allow this healing to fully occur for him. So we're going to dive into his lab test results. Um, this was an 80-year-old fella that uh, his family reached out to me. Uh, he'd been diagnosed early on with some um, like early Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we did some testing, and I just feel that there's that early Alzheimer's may not be that accurate of a diagnosis. I think some of these issues that he's dealing with are actually what's causing some of the neurological symptoms. So as always we dive into looking at basic blood markers, and this is this patient. So we look at the blood markers, remember green is good, yellow is outside of our healthy range, and red is outside the laboratory sick range, and we see some of his like sodium, chloride, calcium, phosphorus is a little off here, his iron was a little low, his gallbladder marker was a little high, and we see massive amounts of inflammation with the ferritin. Now that's up to, um, that's up to 718 and pretty daggone high. We wanna see it get below 236. So this is um, telling us that there's something in his body that's creating massive amounts of, inf of inflammation. When we look at a second page here, we're gonna see his white blood cells at the top. We see his bacterial marker, his neutrophil is elevated. Uh, monocytes just say, hey guy, there's some type of infection. His cholesterol is uh, just minutely elevated at 201, not a big deal. Wow, his TSH is a little elevated. His T3 is a little bit low. He's not clearing hormones too well with his T3 uptake. And uh, we're having some blockage essentially of his thyroid hormones getting into the cells with this free T3 and this reverse T3 here. So his homocysteine, he's not methylating, so genetically we're gonna look at his genes, and we do that on every new patient. His CRP was pretty elevated at 9.79, so that's about almost 10 times higher than what we wanna see it at. So we see his basic blood work and we go, okay, great, we, we've got a little bit of answers here, but now why? Why are we having massive amounts of inflammation uh, with the homocysteine, the CRP, and the ferritin? So on every patient we run an organic acids test, that's gonna give us some nutritional deficiencies, and that's also gonna show us about any candida or bacterial overgrowth. Here's this patient. So he's got three markers that are through the roof for candida. Now we know that the candida is gonna cover and smother the mitochondria is how I like to explain it. The mitochondria are like your car's battery. So if they can't produce the energy, you know what happens. So we've got three markers here that are through the roof for high amounts of candida. These are the metabolites that we're measuring here. Then if we also look at like number two, we look at number four, number five, these are starting to get elevated as well. So we wanna see these shift and go down. Um, I will on our next weekly round show you some follow-up labs, but this dramatically improved within a short amount of time for this patient. Now number 10, 11, and 12, and 13, these are some of his bad bacterial markers that we're looking at. His good bacteria wasn't very good. And then number 15 and number 18 are pretty high. So we've got some gut dysbiosis. We see that on most chronic patients. And it's really great when we go back and recheck these tests and compare and see that things get better. So let's take a look. I had a feeling that maybe there may have been some mold. I When we talked to them, they mentioned that there may have had some mold or some water damage in their home. Uh, that our old home was in a different state. They actually had that home tested and sure enough, it came back high amounts of mold, lots of water damage. So they went and then did all their mold remediation in that home. They no longer lived in that home. They own the home, but they live in a different state now. So when we looked at his mold levels, you're going to see the first test here, or the first page here, this is going to show that his arachotoxin A is elevated. So this happens primarily through water damage buildings. And this was pretty elevated. So you see that little black line? 
and that black line is indicating that yeah, there's high amounts of that uh, mycotoxin, which is a, basically mold. So they're measuring mold levels in the body. And then we see the second page here, we've got some more elevations of mold. And now this mycotoxin gets produced by a couple different species of mold, um, but they're all from water damaged buildings. Okay, so we saw this and we went, aha, okay, well, his body is holding on to mold. I bet he doesn't detox very well. So then we ran this genetic testing. So every new patient, we get a full blood panel ran, we get some nutritional deficiency testing done through the organic acids test, and we always run genetic testing because to me, the genetic testing is gonna to get to the true root problem of why all of this occurred to begin with. So when we look at his detoxification page here, he has four genetic mutations that are all impacting how well his body's gonna essentially pull mold out of his system. So we know that he doesn't make an acetylcysteine very well with this first genetic mutation, and then he's got these other two that are telling us he doesn't make glutathione very well. So glutathione, the mother of all antioxidants, its job is to get inflammation down. Here, he's gonna have a very hard time doing that. Uh, you're also gonna see this SOD2 genetic mutation that he's homozygous for. What that means is that both parents pass that version of the gene down to him. And what's really important about this gene is if you have any toxins that are going to impact the mitochondria, this is gonna make essentially the mitochondria more susceptible to these toxins destroying the mitochondria. So remember, the mitochondria are the batteries, right? Their job is to produce the energy. And in this fella, guess what? His energy is just crashed. His energy is not there. So because of this genetic mutation, that's telling us that his mitochondria need more support. And that's actually something we had them do today. We had them really ramp up his mitochondrial support. Everybody's threshold is a little different. And his wife reported seeing some good positive results. And we're also using what's called Rife technology with them. So we had to run a certain frequency today with the Rife machine. And then we added in some more mitochondrial support. So sure enough, this explains why his body's gonna have a hard time getting rid of those mycotoxins and the mold. Now, this next test, I just had a suspicion after a couple months, like we were progressing pretty well within that first month, second month, and then it's like we hit a little roadblock or a plateau. Things just weren't really making a lot of sense to me of why he wasn't progressively getting better. So I pulled out the last hammer daddy test, which is the Lyme disease testing. So some of his antibodies, his IgG antibodies, are right at the threshold at 0.8, and the cutoff point is 8 or 0.81. So to me, that's a positive. His Western blot showed three bands that were positive. I know, I know, I know. We need five bands, but when a patient is showing symptoms that correlate to Lyme, and we see some antibodies that are right at that threshold, and we see some positive bands in the Lyme test, that is good enough for me. We're gonna call this uh, Lyme disease. So then we started really ramping up, killing off some of the Lyme disease. Now, it's been tough. We've been working with him for since December, and here we are in September, and he still has not progressed how we want him to. So it, not everyone heals very quickly. Not everybody heals with the first treatment protocol, the second or the third, constantly changing what you're doing and trying to find ways to better these patients' health. That's our big goal, but it's not always the easiest in some patients. Um, I still firmly believe that this patient is gonna get better. I just think that we're, we're figuring out still some of those missing pieces of the puzzle and other things that we have him doing is ozone therapy. He does ozone therapy at a, at a clinic, ozone therapy at home. He is in long distance, so he's not here at the clinic. And so he's doing that. He's doing Rife technology, and man, we've, been, we've been doing a lot for this individual. But this is one of my more complicated cases. Not everybody comes out smelling like roses right off the bat within the first few months. So I wanted to share this case with you. I will follow up on this case as well and show you some more follow-up labs um, especially once he gets done doing some treatment in Utah. We'll have another weekly rounds dedicated to this individual. So we'll see you on next week's weekly rounds.